my name is Professor Stephen Johns, and well, actually, my name is Steve, so uh, my title would be Professor Stephen Johns in this instance, but that doesn't necessarily, uh, doesn't necessarily mean anything to this group, because what we're going to do in this group today is have a shared space where, uh, where we share stories, where we share parts of ourselves. I teach communication studies here at TCC. And I want to take a few moments to set parameters for the way the discussion should go today. Before we do that, I'd like to acknowledge that we are standing on land that belongs to indigenous people to whom we pay tribute. We agree that it is essential to take time as a community to acknowledge that the land that we are so fortunate to call TCC is ancestral and unceded territory of First Nations peoples. The Puyallup tribe, a member of the Coast Salish tribal peoples, have called this area home since time immortal. In 1854, the Medicine Creek Treaty forcibly removed them from their lands and onto the Puyallup Reservation. The state of Washington has the seventh largest Native American population in the U.S. with federal, or 29 federally recognized tribes that are represented, as well as several unrecognized tribes. We recognize that the privilege of our campus being on this land on which we now stand comes at a great cost to the Coast Salish peoples. We gather here knowing that our presence is part of an ongoing invasion that these lands were and continue to be forcibly and unlawfully taken from original indigenous inhabitants. We acknowledge that these injustices are true and we're here for indigenous communities around the globe, like the First Peoples of Mauna Kea, Papau, and New Zealand, just to name a few. So the purpose of those statements are not to bring attention to ourselves for saying them, but uh, to show respect and recognize that there is an enduring relationship of indigenous people to the land. And we need to continue to learn about it and raise awareness and uh, honor histories that are often suppressed or forgotten. I want to thank Dr. Ramos and the PTK for putting this all together, and especially thank the people who are here to share their stories. Because words matter, truth matters, and stories matter. We're privileged today to hear stories from volunteers who will make themselves vulnerable, and they'll share details with us that we may or may not relate to. They might surprise us, they might not. In listening to and interacting with one another in these stories today, we ask that you agree to the following norms and these guidelines that are expected behavior of this group. They are to one, stay engaged. So don't let your heart and mind check out. You feel it happening, remember why you're here. Try to make it more than I'm here for a grade. Be respectful. So in communication, we know not to interrupt, but we also want to acknowledge that people are telling really vulnerable stories, and there will be times when you might not get it or might not understand, which leads me to point three. Speak your truth through inquiry, inquiry not judgment. So it's okay to not understand. It's okay to disagree. But instead of judging it, ask questions that would lead to, understand, and lead to understanding. And fourth, consider the intent versus impact of your words. What intent versus impact means is uh, to think before you speak. Check the potential impact of your words and remember that it's on us to choose our words with care. Thank you, and let's enjoy this time together and learn from one another. Good afternoon. My name is Ann Martinez, and I'm a member of the Chi Gamma Phi Theta Kappa Club here at TCC. I'll be helping with introductions today of our speakers. Please, let's give another warm round of applause for Professor Stephen Johns and his welcome statement. And I would like you to assist me in warmly welcoming our first speaker, Luis Bautista.
All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Luis Bautista, and to a few are known as Alex. Our student ID is nine digits long, but we are more than just a series of numbers here at TCC. My story at Tacoma Community College begins when I first moved here to the state of Washington from Los Angeles, California, with my family early this year. My family consists of my mother, who was victorious over cancer, my seven-year-old Yorkie mixed dog, who also has encountered several near-death experiences, and myself, a miracle child who was only expected to live a few years after birth. Living the majority of my life in the diverse community of Boya Heights in East LA has opened my eyes to many things in life. Not only have I been learning about life, but as well as my culture. For example, Hispanics, land folk, are very protective people with who they are close to and will do almost anything for that person to make sure that they are all right. One way to tell that you have our loyalty is if you hear the phrases, I got you, or I'm down for you, or anything similar. Once you have gained our trust completely, there's no easy way of getting rid of us. Not only are we protective of those who we care for, but we also help out to those we see struggling. Witnessing these acts of kindness has made me proud of my community and has taught me the rights and wrongs on how to act during certain situations. Being raised in a single parent household has made me realize several things in order for my family to live a better lifestyle. Sacrifice is one of those things which is something my family and I had to experience numerous times. The window time to bond with my mom was barely cracked open due to her working several jobs at a time just to make ends meet and the numerous times of visiting the healthcare facilities. Seeing her eat very little just so I can have a full meal and later on hearing her scrape of what was very little food that was left over on the pan because she was still hungry. I had to make difficult decisions for for the most part growing up, such as navigating through alleyways to cut time in order to get home before dark, or ending a friendship that has lasted for years, all because that person decided to follow a different path that they thought was best at the time, and you didn't want to be dragged along or get caught in their business. So far, my experience in love has been nothing other than passion, hard work, self-discipline, and pushing limits. If it wasn't for that same person, music would not be as important as it is for me today. I play guitar as a hobby, and I used to study the art of audio recording, thanks to a nonprofit called A Place Called Home and the amazing instructor, Joaquin. I would also like to thank my friend, Davey Zagir, who may rest in peace, for pushing me to sit in the after school program before APCH and see his band, Wakari Masin, perform all over Southern California. There's a song by the, by, the heavy, by the British heavy metal Iron Maiden called Wasted Years. I still remember the first time I heard the song in middle school and understood the meaning behind the lyrics. The reason why I am making a big deal out of the song is not because it's one of my favorite songs or talk about its amazing guitar solo, but to talk about the hook in the song. And it goes like this. So, understand, don't waste your time always searching for those wasted years. Face up, make your stand, and realize you're living in the golden years. The line, face up, make your stand, and realize you're living in the golden years, stands out the most to me. It makes me appreciate all the struggles my family and I had endured throughout the years and savor the now that we are currently living in. It is safe to say that growing up, everyone has had heroes in their life, whether they have relationships with them or the person is a public figure of some sort. My heroes growing up are still my heroes to this day. Carlos Santana, Eugenio Derbez, and Gabriel Iglesias are people who I have idolized throughout the years and I aspire to be like them in some way. Before I talk about why I want to be like them, let's first find out who they are and what do they have in common. Carlos Santana, one of Mexico's most influential musicians that has a very distinct style and unique sound when playing his guitar. 
combining multiple genres such as soul, blues, rock, and adding that Latin flair has a large discography behind his name. His popular songs like Black Magic Woman, Gypsy Queen, a collaboration with Rob Thomas in the song Smooth, and one of my personal favorites, Oye Como Va. Probably his most memorable highlight in, in his career was his big debut in Woodstock, the same Woodstock where Jimi Hendrix played the national anthem on his guitar. Eugenio Derves, an actor and director in his own films and TV shows, who has been rejected various times by the Mexican television network, but that didn't stop him from making a name for himself. He created his own shows, skits, and movies with his own money when he first started in his acting career. You're probably familiar with his most recent films, such as Instructions Not Included, Overboard, or his hit TV series La Familia Peluche, which can be found on Netflix. Gabriel Iglesias, a famous comedian along with Paul Rodriguez, George Lopez, Cheech Marine, and Felipe Esparza, has performed in his shows worldwide. In one of his shows, he talks about how he had to overcome a wide range of obstacles to get to where he is right now. One of those obstacles were, were how he was labeled as a Spanish comedian and says that there was nothing wrong at first, but he wants to be acknowledged as a regular comedian like other big acts. Now he has respect that has been actively seeking for from the media and press. Besides being a comedian in his career, he has also given the opportunity in, to be in films as well. Now that I talked about who they are, what do these three high profile people have in common? They have the desire and determination or as I like to call it in Spanish, ganas. The desire to strive for their careers, to push forward no matter how thick their glass ceiling is for them, because at the end of the day, it's all worth, it's all worth it and they're leaving a legacy behind in their careers. Now what I want to do is practice this exercise with everyone. If everyone is comfortable to stand up and just come forward of course, if obviously, like, um, there's nothing, you know, bothering you or you're not feeling any pain of some sort, please come forward for a little bit. <coughs> right. So this exercise will consist of me reading um, the lines to a song. Um, Unfortunately, the title of the song is not as positive as the lyrics, but it's called In Ashes They Shall Reap by a metal band, Hatebreed. So I will say one line and you repeat after me. I was born to bleed. I was born to bleed. Fighting to succeed. Fighting to succeed. Fighting to succeed. Built to endure what this world throws at me. Built to endure what this world throws at me. All right, now we're going to repeat it all together now. Born to bleed, fighting to succeed, built to endure what this world throws at me. A little bit louder now. Born to bleed, fighting to succeed, built to endure what this world throws at me. One more time. Born to bleed, fighting to succeed, built to endure what this world throws at me. Everyone in the back now. Born to bleed, fighting to succeed. Built to endure what this world throws at me. One more time all together. Born to bleed, fighting to succeed. Built to endure what this world throws at me. Thank you. You may sit down. Oh, it's not over yet. <laughs> it's not over yet. Now the question is, where do I leave off now? All right. Thank you for participating. I'll end this with one of my favorite quotes from a movie inspired by real events called Stand and, Be um, Stand and Deliver. If we expect people to be losers, they will be losers. If we expect them to be winners, they will be winners. They will rise or fall to the level of expectations of those around them 
especially their parents and teachers. I would like to thank Phi Theta Kappa and everyone who helped organize this event and also given me the honor to share my story with you all. Through hard work, self-discipline, a great support team, and having a goal in mind, success is a lot closer than you think. Have a wonderful day, and I am expecting to see these same faces walk on stage, flip their tassel from one side to the other on graduation day. Those were wonderful, meaningful words. Please join me uh, for another round of applause for Luis sharing his story with us. Our next speaker is Griselda Curington. Hi guys, um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, huh? Closer? Closer. Okay. <laughs> um, my name is Griselda. I am a student at TCC. And um, I am a survivor. So, um, growing up, I lived with two secrets. One, which was my parents um, were gay, and the second one, that I was undocumented. Um, it wasn't easy growing up. Um, I still remember the day that my parents, this, I was in middle school, the first time that my parents actually came out to their friends and, you know, introduced to themselves at a party as a couple. Um, they had been together since I was three, so for them to do this, for it took them a long time for them to do this, um, which was very scary. Um, I remember being nervous for them because I didn't know how the people around them were going to react to them saying this. Um, but you know, they were just tired. They were tired of hiding their love for each other, hiding who they were, keeping all this a secret. They didn't have to sit down and tell me that this was not accepted in society. I just, it was something that I knew growing up because I was the only one in my friends that had uh, same-sex parents. You know, it was not common and I didn't see that. So I never told anyone that they were. I used to lie and tell my friends, um, oh, I live with my, with my aunt and my mom. And they believed it because, you know, my, my mom's wife, was brown like me and had dark hair <laughs> and so they actually thought that she was my mom um which was funny but when they came out um i said well i was proud of them and i said well why should i hide them when they're doing an amazing job in raising me um as their daughter so i started telling my friends you know um, my close friends and now when i meet people i'm not ashamed to tell them oh yeah, my parents are, are gay. I still get, you know, those responses as some people don't care that, okay, that's cool. Others still feel like it's a disease. Does that mean you're gay too? And I'm, I'm like, no, <laughs> it doesn't. Um, others, I've, I've lost friends because, you know, it's not in the Bible. It says, I, you know, that's unacceptable and whatnot. So I've lost friends because of that as well. You know, so they had to go through being gay and my mother as being undocumented, which was a hard, two hard things to live with. Um, the undocumented part, I never had to tell anyone because I lived in the border in El Paso, right by, by Juarez, Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. And um, so I was just like everyone else. You know, a Hispanic, a Mexican little girl in school, uh, nobody cared. Um, my mom always made sure that I just never told anyone, you know, because there's evil people out there. And she was like, I don't want to get deported. So she always lived with a fear of being deported, which, you know, I didn't know how 
being undocumented, I, I just never thought about it, how it would affect me till I got to high school. And um, I remember qualifying for a scholarship um, because I had written a paper, they liked it, and so they offered me a scholarship. And uh, we left, and so I asked my mom, so what happened, you know, what's, what's next? And she said, well, nothing, you are undocumented, you don't qualify for the scholarship. And I was like, okay, but I worked hard for it, you know, I got it, so what's next? And she said, reality is, if you do not have a social security number, you do not qualify for, you can't work, you can't go to college, and you know, unfortunately, I can't afford it. She was out, you know, cleaning houses, taking care of elderly people, of children, selling plates in warehouses, you know, to the workers there. So how could she afford college? So that was a really big slap in the face for me. Um, I just was like, well, what am I doing? What's life for me here if I can't work, can't go to college, can't do anything? What's life? What am I supposed to do? So I gave up. I gave up. I ended up moving in with my boyfriend. I ended up having a baby. I uh, dropped out of school, and that was my life. And he, he became abusive to me and would threaten me and take advantage because I was undocumented. So it was a constant thing of, um, I will deport you, I will take the kids away from you, and you and your mother will go back to Mexico. So I lived with fear. I lived with fear that he would take my children away. And um, so he became abusive and I never reported him. I lived with him for seven years, you know, pushing, shoving, and then things just got worse. I remember the day that um, he came home, I guess sprung on drugs, I don't know what, what it was, but started fighting with me and this was the day he pushed me so hard that I felt back. Even though my daughter was in my hands, you know, he didn't care. She went flying out of my arms. Luckily she fell into the couch <clears throat> and wasn't hurt. Um, his mother was able to rip him away from me and as soon as I was able to get away, I grabbed my daughter and ran out. I ran, I left with my children. Of course the cops were called, not by me, but the neighbors. And when they got there, I was like, I'm, I'm done. You know, I'm gonna be deported. My kids are gonna be taken away. And uh, that wasn't it. It wasn't it. Um, I didn't know that there was help out there. I was so frightened that I never spoke about what was happening to me. So no one knew, not even my mom. And um, I was able to become a permanent resident, uh, permanent resident because of the abuse that he put me through. So um, I was able to stay in the United States with my kids. Um, unfortunately, I ended up falling around the same steps. Uh, I got married this time. I was doing better because now I was working legally. I was, you know, he moved me up here with promises of a better life. So we moved to Washington, away from my family. I had no friends, I didn't know anyone. And, um, you know, I started seeing some of the same uh, things that my ex used to do, you know. I was working and I would come home and get called names, still had to clean, still had to cook, still had to do all this stuff. And I had to, was forced to stay home. And it started with the name calling, punches on the wall, and I was like, next is gonna be me. And I already knew this, I had already been through it. My kids were hiding under the, the bed. Why are my kids hiding under the, under the bed? So I put a stop to it. I was like, I don't care how far from my family I am, if I have to move back, 
I will move back. And um, I ended up calling the cops and permanently kicked him out of my home. And uh, unfortunately, you know, with all that, I got fired. My, my daycare was just not working out with the, my work schedule. Things were so hard. They were looking so down, I was so depressed. I was so lonely. I was here all alone. But after I got fired, I decided to come back to school. And the closest school was TCC. And I didn't think I was gonna finish. I didn't even think I was gonna make it because I needed to pay bills. I needed to take care of my children. And school is not cutting it. But I cried my eyes out at workforce and I told them I'm quitting. I'm, I can't continue to school. And they said, no, stay. Um, they were able to give me a work study position. Even though it wasn't as much as I was getting, I had to budget. There was resources, a lot of resources out there for me. They helped me with daycare, with just so many things here at TCC that my children were able to witness 2017, me walking down the gym aisle with my high school diploma. So I said I was just gonna get my high school diploma. <laughs> Thank you. I said I was just gonna get a high school diploma and move on and get a, you know, a different type of job, a better job. But instead, I stuck around. I'm still at TCC. I'm gonna graduate, I think, to 21, and for my AA, Human Services, because I wanna give back. I want people to know that you can't give up. There's help out there. And, you know, if I could do it, they could do it. Now I've applied for my U.S. citizenship and I'm just waiting to, you know, for that call to become, you know, take my test and become a U.S. citizen. But all that, I didn't let any of that bring me down. And I'm still with my kids working hard, you know, for a better living, a better life and accomplish everything that I dream because I know I can. I've done it, I've survived, and I'm still thriving for it. So thank you guys. Thank you so much, Griselda, for your vulnerability and sharing your story of strength with us. Please join me in giving her another round of applause. Our next speaker will be Tabitha Kopp. You're accidentally sneak peeking everything else. <laughs> Thank you everybody for being here today. My name is Tabitha. Um, I am the president of Phi Theta Kappa. Whew. And I'm here to share my story. Um, I had a really great childhood, which is probably not the typical story that you're expecting to hear when you walk in the doors today. Um, but I had regular middle class parents who worked jobs, came to award ceremonies. Uh, my mom sewed all of my Halloween costumes. I never had store bought. She always made them by hand. Um, she made her own clothes. She was always very festive. So one year, for Christmas, she actually made herself a green dress and we hung Christmas ornaments on it and it was a Christmas tree dress. And it doesn't seem like it should, but as I got older, I started to get sadder and more confused and I had all these emotions that I didn't know what to do with. I didn't know how to handle and I couldn't give them names so I didn't know how to categorize them. And the more into my teenage years I got, the sadder I got and the less I was able to communicate. And I remember one time I saw a commercial on TV and it was for like Zoloft or Prozac or one of those other well-known antidepressant drugs. And it was talking about, are you sad all the time? Do you just want to sleep? And I thought, yeah. And by the end of the commercial, they said, well, you might have depression, talk to your doctor about this. And I thought, I'm just a kid. I can't have depression. I can't be depressed, I'm just a kid. What do I have to be depressed about? And so I ignored it. And it got worse, and it got worse, and it got worse. 
and I started failing classes and I was skipping school. We lived very close to the school and my parents both worked full time. So I went to school after they went to work. There was no one there that I had to be accountable to. So I just stopped going. I just didn't go. And then I started to feel this buildup of emotion, this tension that I couldn't name. And I couldn't control it, and it would burst out at inopportune times, and sometimes I would just cry. And I started cutting. And for those of you who are not familiar, cutting is a form of, and this is not an advertisement for it, but it is a form of uh, what they call self-mutilation. So I would take uh, pins like thumbtacks, uh, other things, and I would make scratches on my arms. And when I did that, I felt better. And I, I don't know how to describe how much better I felt when I did that, because it was like all of these things were bottled up. And then I would do that, and I felt like I could breathe for the first time in so long, until I cut too deep. I was sitting at the computer one night, my parents had already gone to bed, and I was just, just so that you guys have an idea of how old I am. It was about the time the internet came out. <laughs> and I was reading a website or something, and I thought, this is what I need to do. I need to cut. I feel sad. I feel bottled up. I have to get it out somehow. I need to cut. And so I did. And it was deep. I had a hole in my arm, you guys. And I didn't know what to do. And I panicked. Who wouldn't panic? And I grab my arm, and I run into my mom's room, my parents' room, and I was like, I think I should go to the hospital. And of course they panicked, because <laughs> who wants their kid to come and say that to them? And it really busted this whole mental health struggle wide open. I spent six or seven hours at the hospital that night. It's a night I won't forget. Doctors coming in, did you try and kill yourself? No, it's on the top of my arm, I know better than that. I want to go home. Why am I here? I want to go home. I don't want to do this. What I didn't know at that time is that my parents were in the hallway talking to CPS because this is a self-mutilation and a lot of times that comes with abuse. I wasn't abused. That's what CPS determined. But I finally got the help that I needed, that I didn't know that I needed, but that I needed. And I started talking to mental health professionals. I finally got on some medication that helped even me out. And I felt like a person again. And then I got caught in the loop of, the medicine makes me feel better, so I don't need it anymore. So I took it, I felt better, I stopped taking it. I felt worse, I took it, I felt better. It was a cycle, and it went on for a long time, until eventually I really was okay without it. And I was functioning, and I was doing well. I was working full time, I decided to come back to college, when I came to TCC five years ago, I was working full time and taking classes part time. And I had just moved out of my parents' house for the first time at the age of 28. <sighs> and I was happy. My roommates were my cousin and her best friend. We got along great at the time, note. And life was good. But I would leave campus or I would leave work and I would go home and I would sit in my car and I would cry. And I would cry for half an hour, an hour, sometimes two hours. Nobody knew I was out there. No one checks to see if your car is out there. Plus, it was an apartment complex. Who's to know? And there were a couple of times where I thought, I don't want to live. I don't want to do this. I'm tired. I don't think I can do this anymore. And I almost checked myself into the psych ward at the hospital. But I didn't, because I thought, I'm not going to do this. I'm not gonna kill myself. I like my life. Why am I sitting in my car crying? I like my life. And so I take a deep breath and go inside and pretend everything was fine. This cycle continued for a really long time and I realized at some point that my depression was back and that I needed to seek treatment. And I didn't know how to do that as an adult. How do you, where, how do you, someone had done it for me when I was a kid. Where do I find a psychiatrist? Where do I find a therapist? How do I get back on medication? I didn't even have a primary caregiver at the time. I didn't know how to tackle this. I went so far as to go onto the um, health website for my employer and I tried to put in therapist and nothing came up. I still have no idea how to find a therapist through a health website, just so you all know. 
And I just kind of let it go. And I thought, I know what some of my triggers are. I can watch for those. I can manage this on my own. So I did, and I managed it quite well for a really long time. Over this last summer, I, um, like I said, I'm president of Phi Theta Kappa, and this project actually that you're at today, this Titan Talks, is done in conjunction with TCC administration, which required some meetings. And so the um, officer team met with Dr. Harrell, who is the campus president, over the summer to discuss what this is gonna look like and what the project was gonna be and all of those things. And after that meeting, I got a phone call. My mom was in the hospital. Now, a little bit of background, because I've mostly talked about me, but my mom was really sick for a very, very long time. She smoked cigarettes, she had numerous health issues, so she was in and out of the hospital quite a bit, actually. She had a number of specialists that she would go and see, but I got this call, and I knew it was different. I don't know how I knew it was different, I still don't know how I knew it was different, but it was different. And there was nothing I could do, so I went over to my friend's house, and we watched TV and chatted for a while, and she knew what was going on. And then I get a phone call from my dad, and he says, you should come to the hospital right now. And I said, okay, I'm on my way. And I hung up the phone, and I looked at my friend, and I could see what I can only imagine was what was on my face reflected on her face. Only she's a crier, and I'm not, so she immediately started crying. And I said, I have to go. And she said, do I need to come with you? And I said, no, I think I can do this. And she said, okay. That was the first day in a week and a half battle that my mom fought for her life. She did not win. I am on anti-anxiety medication. I got that diagnosis actually from help here at the counseling services at TCC. I stopped taking it immediately because I knew that as much as I hate my anxiety, as much as I feel like there are bugs crawling under my skin sometimes, that I would need it, that it would help me. So I stopped taking my medication, and for a week, I slept on the floor of the ICU. But I like that time. I treasure that time, even without the medication. I got to have conversations with my mother that I would not have gotten to have if it wasn't for me stopping that medication, because I was awake, and I was alert, and I was antsy, so I was always there, and I was taking care of her in the ways that she needed to be taken care of. After a week in the ICU, we moved her to hospice. We decided that it was time to just let go. She had been sick for a very long time, and this was it. This was end game. This was the end. So I started the medication again because I knew that when the day came and that it was coming very, very soon, I would need to have tempered emotions. I would need to be able to control myself. And when the day came, I was. But you're never really ready. Never ready. Even if it's coming, you're never ready. And I got to hold my mom's hand and brush her hair from her eyes as she died. And then she was gone. And my whole world changed. The person who made the Christmas tree dress wasn't there, who sewed all of my Halloween costumes and made sure to show up at all of my award ceremonies, who served on PTK and did chaperoning for uh, elementary school events. She was gone. The person who took care of the dog. That poor dog probably didn't eat for three days because we forgot. Poor dog. <laughs> but she was gone. And even though I felt like I had gotten better, and like I was managed on medication, after that happened, I immediately enrolled myself back in counseling services because I knew my life would never be the same. I knew what I needed. I learned my triggers. I learned the things that set me off and the things that helped me be better. And I was able to ask for the things that I needed. In addition to that, I had also learned over summer quarter that access services here on campus can help with anxiety. With the passing of my mom and my anxiety being through the roof, I was missing classes, I was missing due dates, and I needed extra help. I needed more help than counseling could offer. And so I reached out to Access Services and they were able to get me the help that I needed. I never wanted to be that person who had to ask for extra help. I wanted to be the person who pulled myself up by my bootstraps and just did it and just figured it out and did it. Not that I would ever look at someone else and say, why are you doing that? You shouldn't need extra help but that's how I felt about myself. And for the first time in my life, I needed someone to help me. I needed someone to tell me that it was okay to be sad and that it was okay to cry in the middle of the day and it was okay that I had a panic attack and I had to leave early and couldn't do what I was supposed to do. 
and I found all of the help that I needed. And as weird as it sounds, I'm really glad I have anxiety. I'm really glad I have anxiety because it helps me complete the things that I need to do. It helped me be what my mom needed me to be as I slept on the floor of the ICU room that last week. It helped me do what I need to do to help put this event on today. It helped me do what I need to do in reaching out to contact people and asking for help. Anxiety has helped me be who I am. And even though I hate it, I'm also really glad that I have it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tabitha, for your heartwarming story. Please join me in giving Tabitha another round of applause for sharing. Our next speaker is Jacqueline Eli. So 18 years ago, I began my education here at TCC. And I started off pretty good. I actually got on honors, and then my mental health started to decline. And I was missing classes, and then I had, I'd had anxiety about coming back, and so I'd miss more classes. And then I was smoking weed to help with my struggles, and then I would just rationalize not going to school. I don't really miss too much. So I ended up um, the last few quarters that I was going to TCC, I had missed so many classes. The very last quarter, I only came on the very first day and didn't even come back. And um, I received a letter from the school notifying me that um, I was being placed on academic suspension. So basically, they told me that I could not come back the next quarter. Um, my mental health struggles didn't begin when I first began attending TCC. They began when I was a child. And I'd like to share a letter that I wrote when I was eight and a half years old. I hate myself and my teacher. She is so mean to me and I really hate myself. I am a dumb person. That's what people say to me, that I am dumb. I really hate myself. I hate my school and my brother and most of all, I hate myself. Yes, me, my own self. I really hate myself. My foot hurts bad and my feelings are hurt by my teacher and my best friend and want to know why I hurt my feelings. It is be just because me. I was playing at school and I fell and they laughed at me. I have had a hard day, but I should have a hard day because I hate myself. And I want to work, but I can't because I am rude. That's what people say to me at school. And I want to kill myself. But everyone says that I am rude, but I am, and it is not worth time to read this because I hate myself. And I can't tell my friends because they will just say I hate you too, to me, and I would not care, and you don't have to tell me you don't like me because I know you don't, and you hate me too, just like my friends. From Jacqueline, no last name because I don't belong here anymore. I should live in a dump, the end. So that's how I felt um, at eight and a half years old. And um, I experienced trauma as a young child. And because of that trauma, the pain from it, I went to counseling. But the behavioral symptoms that I showed after that led me to feel feelings of guilt and shame. Um, I thought I was a horrible person. For instance, I was stealing from my parents and doing other things that were um, not in alignment with what I believed to be a good person actions. So I kept continuing living my life, making choices that were leading me to confirm this feeling that I was horrible and I deserved to die. I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder, social and generalized anxiety disorder and ADD when I was 13 years old. And I was put on psychiatric medications. These medications were meant for these disorders that I was diagnosed with, and I thought as a result, I had some hope. Hey, I'm gonna take these and I'll get better. But what was going on was I was still feeling horrible about myself. I, um, I was still feeling suicidal, and I didn't share that with people. 
Um, but as I continue living my life and taking these medications as prescribed, still feeling no hope, but going through the motions, um, I spent the next 19 years on meds. And then uh, I started here at TCC and um, like I said, my struggles led me to do, well, I was doing well, and then I started to decline. And um, here was that confirmation, yep. no good, no hope. Here I am, just a loser, I'm a failure, and why am I even trying? So I didn't believe that I was capable of earning a college degree. My GPA was at a 2.5 when I left, and um, through the years, I ended up being diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder. Now, I read about this disorder, and I was like, wow, this is me. Oh my gosh, like, I, I have a newfound hope. Um, this is like I'm reading about my life. And what happened was I began to identify as my disorder. This was me. I, you know, I have hope as long as meds are going to help. So I was seeing a psychiatrist. Um, I ended up being hospitalized for being suicidal. I was um, sleeping all the time. When I wasn't sleeping, I was irritable. I wasn't taking care of my household duties. I wasn't taking care of myself, period. I didn't have the energy. I wasn't responding to messages. Um, my mom would call, she'd show up at the door, and um, I would hide. I was using uh, marijuana and alcohol to try to cope. And I wasn't even having the energy to read my messages, um, much less respond. I didn't want people to know how horrible I was feeling. Because if they knew, then you know what good did that help? I was just going to bring them down. So I just held it in and I hid from people. I withdrew, and as long as you know I wasn't around people, um, then they didn't know. I'd make plans, and I wouldn't follow through. And um, my parents ended up contacting my then husband at the time, and um, my mom had looked up information and found out that she could take me to the emergency room. So she took me to St. Joseph Hospital, and I ended up spending five days there. And what happened was I had a break from my reality. I got to work on myself and focus on what was going on in my life, and that was, that was very helpful. But when I left, what I experienced was what's called a pink cloud. I had this false sense of security, this belief that I could take on anything. I mean, I'd have five days away from my reality, per se. And um, once I had the first fight with my ex-husband, uh, I ended up falling further down, and I was more depressed and more suicidal than when I had entered the hospital. But having been diagnosed with these disorders, I continued to take medications and I started seeing a psychiatrist. I would tell the psychiatrist, okay, I'm struggling. And he's like, okay, I'm gonna add this medication. Next time I come back, I'm still struggling. Okay, increasing the dosages. Come back, now I'm still struggling. And I'd share things that I was struggling with. These were, um, things that were life situations and what, whatever. And um, he's like, okay, well, I, I got this new med and I'm gonna go ahead and add this. And um, I'm like, okay, you know, hoping for that magic pill because I was miserable. I wanted to die. And I was feeling like I was just this horrific person based on behaviors stemming back from my childhood that were confirmed by behaviors that I, um, that happened throughout my life. So I continued taking these medications and I would fill this pill container each night, taking nine medications I got up to, nine psychiatric medications. And um, some of those I would take three times a day. Um, and I got tired of filling that container. I got tired of putting all these pills in here and thinking, you know, here I am taking all these medications and I'm still feeling horrible. And um, I ended up in, a, I ended up in a relationship around that time that was severely abusive. So here I had already been abusing myself mentally. I'd already been telling myself that I'm horrible, that I should die, 
you know, that's self-abuse. So then I'm in a relationship with somebody who has similar struggles and we bonded and um, we bonded over our struggles. And then he started to abuse me and I was vulnerable to it because that's how I felt about myself. So, hey, these meds aren't working and I have no hope. And um, sadly it was, I wouldn't say it was welcome, but I wasn't turning it away. So I, here I experienced somebody else telling me that I was horrible, I deserved to die, and then was trying to take my life. And I ended up um, starting to, well, let's see, I tried to take my life after that because I stopped taking those medications. I was tired of taking those. I stopped them um, abruptly. Not the most healthy choice, not recommended. But... Um, I had lost all hope, and within a couple of months, I tried taking my life. And um, I, I failed at that. And that's how I saw that. I'm a failure, once again, at something that I'm trying and was hoping for. Wow, you know? <laughs> like, um, so I ended up going and getting help. He asked me to get help so I could be there for him. So I had hope. Somebody wanted me to be there for them. And um, I ended up going to the hospital and checking in. And at that time, just prior to that, I had actually started using hard drugs with him. I had started using methamphetamines and heroin. And, um, and I had started living in my car. And so I had switched from taking Adderall for ADD and started using meth and rationalizing why it's an amphetamine and I'm taking a methamphetamine. Um, and then clonopin for my anxiety to heroin. So, you know, again, that rationalization, I was getting some of my needs met. But um, when I checked in the hospital, because I had the mental health struggles and also the addiction, they ended up transferring me to Fairfax which is a hospital that I had gone to before during the day, but this was for co-occurring disorder treatment. That's for mental health and drug addiction. And then I still was struggling with being suicidal and um, I ended up transferring to another hospital. And while I was there, my ex was saying he wanted to kill himself and he wanted me to be there for him. So he asked me to come back. And um, I said, I can't be there for you. I'm not even better myself. And um, there was a pastor in there, and I asked him if he would pray for us. And I told him I didn't know how to pray. I was raised Catholic, and I recited prayers, and I had turned from my faith. And, um, and so I asked him about that, and he encouraged me to pray for guidance. And for the first time in my life, I prayed and I asked God for guidance. And that was a turning point in my life because before I had sought out help with counseling, medications, hospitalization, other ways of coping. But this was the first time in my life that I asked for help from God. And it was weird. It was a little uncomfortable, honestly. And I was scared because I didn't know what that prayer would lead to. But what it led to was a change in perspective. What I experienced was seeing that I wasn't alone and that there was purpose in all of the challenges and struggles I was experiencing. So these challenges and struggles led to learning and growth opportunities. This domestic violence that I experienced where someone was trying to take my life led me to fight for my life unlike ever before. To see that I had um, more self-esteem than I actually believed. To actually acknowledge the positives about myself and that I was gaining self-worth through that, that horrible time. Um, when I experienced homelessness, I've experienced a variety of homelessness from living in a car, living in the streets, living in trailers, living in tents. And um, what it did was I, I had been raised upper middle class and experienced a life more privileged. And I, there I was experiencing a life without. Um, I have so much more gratitude for little things like water and shelter and a structured environment that helped me lead to structure in my life. So through those challenges, I became a better person. 
I overcame so much of the struggles that I was already experiencing and I saw that I actually wanted to live. I haven't taken any psychiatric medication since 2015 and that was after four hospitalizations for mental health. Um, I, uh, I, once again, I didn't plan on coming back to TCC and since coming back last September, I've been getting 4.0s every quarter. So um, that's, that's incredible. And, um, and I must admit that each quarter, I struggle with belief in myself. I remember coming in um, when I first came here and talking to Dr. Barb and telling her, um, she asked me if I plan on going on for a four-year degree. And I said, no. I was like, I didn't even plan on getting here. And um, she's like, oh, I, you're going there. And um, she, she had belief in me. And so it was because of people holding on to belief in me that helped me to gain belief in myself. And then as I started believing in myself, I've been able to help others gain belief in themselves. And one of my teachers uh, who's retired from here, Jim Carroll, he's, he taught us that self-care is job number one. So I learned that big time when I was um, when I was struggling. And then when I heard that in school, I was like, oh, absolutely. If we don't take care of ourselves, like we can't depend on others to take care of us. We are all in this world that's full of pain, full of guilt, full of shame, people hurting others because they're hurting. And so we have the opportunity to take care of ourselves first and really look out for our best. And then we can seek out help and be there for others. But um, I just, I have done so much and experienced so much pain and that pain led to so much gain. So I realized that through those experiences, we gain different lenses. And say, for instance, somebody experiences getting bit by a pit bull. And then they think that all pit bulls are aggressive, they're going to bite, and they live in fear. Well, we have an opportunity. We can take off those shades, those lenses. Or we can let them continue clouding up our view and limiting our experience in life. So I encourage you all to consider your perspectives of yourself, others, and your experiences. And think about them. Are they... Um, helping you or are they limiting you? Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacqueline, for sharing your powerful story with us. Please join me in giving Jacqueline another round of applause. Please welcome our next speaker, Athena Wallstrom. Uh, this story is about someone, is the sound okay? Okay. This story is about someone that experienced a little bit of globe trotting, a little bit of abuse mentally, physically, and more, a little bit of academic sabotage, and a whole lot of, sorry, I am recording myself. Sorry. Uh, anyways, a whole lot of academic struggle. There's some anxiety and depression in there, but that's not what defines me. My name is Athena Wallstrom, and I identify as a third culture kid. If you, can you, do you want to scoot over? I feel so bad. I, I have to be in my home. I don't want you to not be able to get me. Uh, anyways, uh, third culture kid is someone that's raised in a different country than their parents, or maybe they're just living temporarily in a country that's not what is on their passport. Uh, that's me. Both my parents served in the army. Though I was born in Colorado, I was in Germany from one month old, so that was my first language. Um, my brother and I spoke perfect native German. Um, my mother spoke German admirably, and I spoke German exclusively until elementary school. Uh, but w she clearly had an accent, and all I had was kind of like what I needed to be able to say to my dad. When we returned to the States, I had no bearing on English, and uh, my brother was actually my translator in life. I was young enough that I picked up English very quickly, uh, but I went to a lot of speech therapy because my accent was a pathology. So that's something we still believe in, I think, even now. Um, while I remember <clears throat> major school-related events, 
I don't have many memories of my childhood. It's not until recently that I started to realize I don't have some of these memories because they're not really memories worth keeping uh, or trying to keep accessible. But I do remember really big things. Uh, my brother's head went through the drywall one night. He took the heat for something I had done. Uh, I remember learning not to cry because if I showed emotion, it would only serve to validate any inquiry I had from, or our family had from CPS or counselors at school. Um, <clears throat> I would rip a hole in my jeans and I would say, oh my God, my parents are gonna kill me, except that's just a common turn of phrase. People asked, are your parents really gonna kill you? And I said, yes, <laughs> because I believed that my parents were going to kill me. Um, there's a reason I legitimately believe that. When I reflect on my childhood, I realize that my parents were not well prepared um, for being parents. And now when I talk to my dad about it, he apologizes for it and I feel so badly. It's just, it's a fact of life. Uh, I went to 14 schools before I graduated from high school. I'm an army brat, but that's actually not the whole story. The military had a significant drawdown in the 90s, and my dad lost his job in the only place that he could imagine himself. He tried pivoting to writing science fiction. He tried opening a software company while this was still a pretty novel concept. Uh, my mom however, did have marketable skills because she was a lineman. Thank you. That is a pretty good pictorial representation of what a lineman would be, someone climbing telephone poles and taking care of business, no matter what the weather is. Um, so she routinely faced discrimination in the workplace because this was a job dominated by and for men. And um, we had to continue to move even after the military. We had to continue to move to escape, escape scrutiny from our community because there's only so long people can display certain signs or uh, burn so many bridges before it becomes difficult to stay in your community. So yes, I'm an army brat, but I moved much more later on in life because of those sort of things. Uh, we had to move from evictions as well because we were living in Boulder, Colorado at that time. Boulder was going through a similar situation that Seattle is going through now and life just became unaffordable. So we moved further away and a little bit further and even further, which on the plains in the winter, that's a pretty big deal. And eventually the time and cost of transportation just became untenable. And so my parents moved to Washington based on the promise of my mom being able to use her skills and her background uh, from being in the army to work at Naval Station Everett and Naval Base Kitsap. And when we moved here, we thought, oh, well, Tacoma's in the middle, so that's a great place to work if you wanna be in those two places. Didn't realize the implication of that. It is part of our story, though. If you're new to the area or live exclusively in the South Sound, you might not realize the foolishness of this decision. Uh, in Tacoma, though, I made amazing friends. I was genuinely excited about school. I had amazing friends. Um, I won district-wide spelling bees. I grasped social sciences really well. And I was a little bit of a math whiz. I'm just gonna say that right now. Uh, in my mom's life, though, every single day was a struggle. Not one struggle a day. It was every single day was a slew of struggles. And my mom's experience in the Army might have set her life straight or given her an outlet to let loose. Still kind of be uh, to be determined what resulted there, but it gave her marketable skills. And that's part of why we survived this time. But at the same time, my dad was just struggling to survive the new world that he was living in. 
Um, I had already normalized moving so much at this point, though, that it really wasn't a big deal. I made friends fast, but one day I came home to a, um, my brother and I, we got home earlier, we came home to a pile of furniture in the front yard because my parents had been evicted, but like big time, and it was completely stunning. It, there was no warning. And we were legitimately homeless for the first time. Um, in order to gain financial freedom, though, my parents decided to move closer to Bremerton by moving to Gig Harbor. Um, you and I both know moving to Gig Harbor to seek an affordable life also really doesn't make sense. Um, I was bullied for having one pair of shoes and one pair of jeans. Uh, in my experience, these were not unusual things uh, to have called out, like it was just completely practical. The teachers weren't much better. Uh, I would have personal items taken from me, like shoes, uh, or even school supplies. If I didn't know the answer to a question that everybody in the class knew, like how many um, days there are in a year, uh, for some context, <laughs> I still forget how many days there are in a year. Uh, and to this point, in the 12 years of regular education that I had, I had had, like even up until this point and all the way until graduation, I had had zero exposure to geometry. And it's not like you miss the semester or you miss the week. I had never been given any information about geometry. So if that's an easy to uh, qualify situation. You can imagine all the other gaps that I had throughout this time. Um, so it was very, very difficult between the bullying and the lack of knowledge that I had. And I couldn't even make it down the driveway. It's like pretty much as soon as I got off the bus, I would be crying. And uh, when my mom was home, I could share the struggles that I was having. And she would, you know, kind of try to give some advice on the social aspect of the situation. But when it came to my scholastics, you're just not good in science. It's, it's not in your blood. Don't worry about the math and science. You've never been good at it. My dad, who can math and theorize with the best of them, tried to help me with math. And I couldn't even make it before the tears started rolling out of frustration. Um, I couldn't even make a mistake, but my parents were powerless to do anything, and I really mean this. Um, my dad had finally secured work for the first time in his life, which people talk about a livelihood, but it's also like your soul. Uh, but around this time, my mom also had to do whatever she could because as the reliable breadwinner, um, she was required to do whatever she could to maintain her work. and. She was given a difficult choice to basically work anywhere across the state for at least about a week at a time or lose her job. So she kept her job. Um, the work arrangement forced her to work in a remote location, so say somewhere near Spokane for four days at a time. And she would come home Thursday nights or midday Fridays she would cook a week's worth of food on Saturdays and sometimes overlap into Sundays. And then she would take off uh, Sunday night or Monday morning. And if we were lucky, we would get a little bit of time to check in as a family before she took off. So my parents couldn't be home and they really couldn't advocate for me either. Uh, my days went like this, school, crying, sleep, school, crying, Sleep. I couldn't get the nerve to go to school a lot of days. I was sick, uh, which I think we're at this point all aware what that really means. Uh, I told my dad recently about how I had basically become um, a deviant and was doing this, and he said he never realized. He just noticed suddenly that I wasn't excited about school anymore. But we moved again, and at last it was somewhere actually affordable. Port Orchard. Uh, this actually means a lot to me because when I was there, 
all the declines I had in school performance really started to disappear except for math. I made friends. I made friends. For the first time since leaving Tacoma, I had friends and enemies, but like friends. So my dad's work stabilized, and so my mom was finally able to experience the luxury of being a stay-at-home mom. Her body was breaking down in very literal terms um, from years in the service, from falling down telephone poles, uh, and the cumulative effects of harassment in the workplace. So uh, she learned more about the schools in my area and in the area South Kitsap has and has had one of the most chronically overcrowded schools for decades. And so my parents decided to put me into a private school until I was old enough to attend Olympic College for Running Start. It's for anyone who's visiting someone else speaking here, a dual completion program for your high school degree and uh, your associates. So at this time, Running Start lacked just enough oversight and coordination with the public school system that my mom was able to serve as my guidance counselor. But in reality, she railroaded as my guidance counselor uh, she intentionally chose classes that made me a great companion and wouldn't result in high school completion either. A few years before enrolling at OC, my brother enlisted in the U.S. Navy, and although at five years our, gap, or our age gap is considerable, the effects of empty nests were already hitting her pretty hard. Uh, she felt the doom of my upcoming departure much earlier than usual. So. My mom picked my education path how she saw fit, and um, it, it's her duty. She finally had a chance to participate, so it made sense, but she had a different priority. My educational path was focused on social sciences almost exclusively. I couldn't math as a verb, but I did try, or a version of trying. I wasn't really held responsible for anything before. I was gifted grown uh, so I could get away with a single contact with almost any material or even just reason my way to the right answer and wing a test completely. So I couldn't wing it. I wasn't gifted. I was being held responsible for the first time in my life and cycled through a year at OC with an academic probation, a suspension, and then good behavior and then rinse and repeat. Uh, but sadly, I came to realize that, surprise, I did have to take a math class. So I took pre-algebra again and again and again. By the way, if you take a class too many times, you can be told to please not take that class anymore because you're obviously not going to succeed. I was not ready to hear that. The relationship with my mom had very confused roles. Uh, through my education, though, I was able to become an even better best friend of my mom. I was able to engage in critical discussions of historical situations and social issues. Uh, each topic also had its accompanying drink pairing. My mom started to let me have alcohol on a frequent basis. <sighs> Starting around the age of 12, by the age of 14, if I wasn't drinking, she was pouring the drinks for me. By the time I was at OC, I was habituated into her ideal drinking partner and best friend. I couldn't get more than a few hours of sleep at night, and this along with the narrative of you can't math. And the lack of accountability in my life led to pretty disastrous academic history. I thought, well, at least if school is not a priority, I can work. Without really knowing it, looking back now, I see that I was looking for some outlet of productivity. Unfortunately, that outlet meant for my mom uh, that I had freedom and independence and an opportunity for autonomy but also that she would lose a drinking partner. I actually had a very long leash as a child. Free range kids is putting it lightly. <laughs> um, I had so much autonomy, but for all the wrong things, I could stay out all night partying, but I couldn't have a job. 
The terms of my liberty were that I quit my job or have my car taken away. Kind of curious. I really started to question what was going on. If you don't want your kids to think for themselves, don't put them into social sciences. Uh, I can't really name what started it. Maybe it was another event or having enough stability just long enough one day, but I knew I couldn't continue living this way. Maybe it was noticing that all my Vicodin and Percocet from every surgery or injury I have ever had randomly disappeared when I tried to find them after a bad sports injury. The root of my awakening might have been that I wasn't allowed to work. Uh, what parent doesn't want their child to start becoming an adult? It was at this time that I had the maturity and openness to start hearing messages from people around me um, that things were probably not okay. And I had mentors saying things finally, you know, that's not normal. And I wasn't able to hear it before or wasn't able to understand it before. And I knew I had to do something. Every few days, I would sneak out to my pile. I started a pile in an obscure place outside of the house when I could, and I brought a thing or two out to the pile. Sometimes this meant walking outside with a jacket on and walking back inside with no jacket on. Uh, I could only make my pile bigger if I wasn't noticed because this pile was to be my provisions for my big getaway. It turns out that my pile never got big enough uh, it came to light that my mom had used my identity as a pseudonym to embezzle $110,000. She needed money to feed the bottomless pit of addiction by whatever means necessary. Uh, when this happened, I left with whatever I could grab from my pile quickly. A flurry of events occurred and it became clear that now was the time. Um, I left, I thought I had nowhere to go but it turned out that the people carefully watching our family knew that something big was going to happen. And they were not surprised when I showed up uh, knocking on their door, asking for help. I reordered my life. All extracurriculars disappeared from my life. I had little direction before and especially no direction after this. Everything was broken, especially my compass. I had a few stable things in my life. My family was my home. There was no physical home. My mother did not do what one expects from their caregiver. Here's the fog. And it all creeped in and couldn't see a thing. I had no answer as to how things could have transpired in such a way. How could I fall so far? I never even got that far. I don't know, I never made it there. I never made it anywhere. I was gifted, right? So I rarely even put in effort to show up and when I did, I was not living in the moment. I was not taking ownership for my future. I had a lot of growing up to do and fast. Someone close to me mentioned Fresh Start, the program for those over the age of 18, trying to complete their high school or GED, associate, um, GED while trying to get an associates. I attended Tacoma Community College in the first few years that this program became available. And I finally got my high school diploma and associates, as was the plan all along. I took a philosophy class that talked extensively about the burst of understanding for uh, personal responsibility and ownership through the postmodern philosophy. This was the message that I needed to hear right now. This was the truth. I finally passed a math class. <laughs> Um, I never really took the time to think about what I wanted to do, though. I was merely surviving and, like, surviving, getting by for the first 20 years of my life. I have a lot of negative self-talk about where I am at this point. I try to remember I was lost most of my life and, like, not even a little bit lost. Put on a blindfold, spin me in a circle, throw me on the moon, and tell me to find Spain. Lost. Um, I'm back in school now, taking the long road, recovering from a disastrous GPA, and by that I mean battling my, uh, my old GPA. I'm navigating negative self-talk. I'm challenging stereotypes that are put on me by myself and others. Um, my whole life, I tried to isolate myself 
and my problems and present the flawless image of the wise warrior Athena, that kid was untrainable and unteachable. Um, I learned what it means to apply myself in something that I am not inherently good at. I even just took like a little bit more math and I got through calculus. I'm now also a member of Phi Theta Kappa, the International Honor Society. I have had opportunities to help my own community by serving as a liaison between Navy families and the command that they're associated with. I enjoy the juggling act of life and the variety it creates. Uh, it can lead to such dynamic and unique experiences. Right now, this semester in a physics lab group I'm in, we have as the first languages, English, German, Vietnamese, and Arabic. This might seem like a challenge, and it is. It's also an opportunity. I have a relationship with my father and brother and the power to fight back when I see members of my own family falling prey to the effects of addiction. Part of my story includes that my mother died of liver failure accelerated by drug and alcohol abuse. Part of my story is what I've told you so far, but I use it as a tool. I let those around me know what a chip I had on my shoulder and that the trick is not just saying that you are gifted or that you believe that you can do it. It's about using what you have in your toolbox to apply yourself. I was surrounded by people with strong feelings about feminism and equality and overall just believing in me throughout my childhood, but that's not enough. Um, so I didn't have the right foundation or discipline. I didn't have it in me to put believing in myself or being believed in to use. And really what I learned is that you have to work for what you believe in and that you're the only one that can do it. I was able to do it because I had a community prop me back up when everything went sideways. I didn't have a parachute because I totally fell. I had to be propped back up. So I take signals about loss of safety and shelter very, very seriously. I take choices even more seriously. I believe that people have way more power in them that they're harness than what they are harnessing. Harnessing your power is really tricky if you don't believe in yourself and if no one believes in you. I challenge you all to consider the barriers to yourself. Not the value of the barrier, but the amount and variety of them. If I hadn't had people around me to catch me and bounce me back onto my feet, I don't know where I would be. There are so many more resources than we realize. Counselors are only just part of it. Uh, the first resource, I believe, is your community. Literally, the person sitting right next to you, the person sitting in front of you. That means that you are a resource and you are a resource. I hope by coming here today that you have had a chance to consider that how people are presenting is relatively normal, <laughs> may actually be facing a slew of issues that have a complex history. People have issues big and small, active and old, controlled and off the tracks. Some brave people spoke here today, many more are still invisible. Normalizing the perception and narrative around these and many other issues is the first step. We have to stop alienating the people around us by using language that is hostile towards the broader expressions of the human condition. We need to understand that the world we live in is now increasingly diverse and the cultures and langu language barriers have meaning, but are not actual barriers. The world can be a place of opportunity found in those challenges or a place of regression from your decision about how to deal with those challenges. That is your choice. I see the changes in an increase in body positive advertising I see us holding companies that prioritize profit over people accountable, as is occurring now in the opioid epidemic. 
I watched the nation go from scrutinizing the seriousness of bullying to accepting it as a real threat to mental health and well-being, and then to bullying finally becoming a tacit fact that we all have an obligation to minimize. I see change in the types of things that we're willing to talk about in performing arts, television, and cinema. Not only do we illustrate mental health issues more frequently, we challenge the narrative and whether and how we are contributing to the issues in the first place. Be there, be the trampoline, be the believer, be the person that holds you and your peers accountable, be the one to start the conversation and stay engaged, be there for you. While I've inherited at the very least my mother's anxiety and depression, I know that there's so much more to me. I have people that believe in me and sometimes just knowing that this cheer squad exists when I want to quit is enough to remind me to keep going. I also think of where I've been. Lastly, I think of two things. When the hill is full of false summits or the summit is completely out of sight, one is, how do you eat an elephant? Does anybody know? One bite at a time. Um, the other is that the symbol of a military child is a dandelion, because a dandelion can thrive anywhere. And I may no longer be a military child, but I will never not be a dandelion. Give me just a little bit of sunshine and rain, just a little bit, and I will just bust through some concrete. Thank you, Athena, for being so brave to share your impactful story with us. Please join me in giving Athena another round of applause. Hi, everybody. I'm Jessica Box. I'm the new treasurer for PTK, and I would like to thank Shannon, the old treasurer, for this idea of Titan Talks. Um, I would also like to thank the TCC administration and all of our other T PTK members. Um, most importantly, um, each and every speaker, and also that if anybody has any sensitive or emotions that were brought up today, that there is a counseling center in Building 7 on campus. Thank you.